Five Questions with Leroy Butler. Now, here's Tom Silverstein. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the virtual edition of Five Questions with Leroy Butler. How's it going? You, you there for real? Yeah, I know, right? It's, you know what? Uh, a lot of people in church were talking about, do you know football season starts this Thursday? I think a lot yeah, of people no. forgot about that with no preseason games and things of that nature. But, yeah, it's getting close enough. And now it's about time to, you know, get your roster set because – and you have to clue me in on all these rules because I know you guys couldn't report who was on the depth chart. I mean, yeah, yeah we still the only concerning thing to me is the offensive line, especially with the Minnesota Vikings signing that one young man whose name I would not try and pronounce. Yeah. Hey, can I just say this? People are tired of me hearing about this, but I guarantee you that back in the day, your day, Mike Holmgren and Ron Wolf didn't care who was listed in first, you know, first team, second team, if the other team knew, they were so confident they were going to win that, you know, they, I don't think they really cared that much. Do you? Uh, well, that's, that's true. That's facts. Uh, I think, remember, a lot of people don't know, but Bruce Wilkerson, he came over, Ron Cox came over for this, from the Bears to the Super Bowl, and, you know, we had Don BB, we had all these guys, and it was plug and play because they felt like the system works. Whatever the system is, West Coast-style offense, defense, what kind of a, a quarters-type defense, every now and then blitz a lot, eight, a lot of eight-man front stuff. It is what it is. And most of these coaches know each other. There's nothing you can surprise. Yeah, them. yeah. It's a mentality, too, that you're not scared. You know, you're not – so um, paranoid that you think something as, as little as a position change is going to be the difference in the game. And, you know, you should be confident that you can switch somebody over to right tackle if you've got an injury or whatever. Anyway, that's my little two cents. You know? <laughs> right. I thought I maybe you would. I would have a surprise at some point. Some teams don't want to do that. They think it's to their man. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you're right. Anyway, let's talk about the cutdowns before we get to the Vikings game. So with these cutdowns, I didn't, you know, if you're talking about surprises, I don't think there were any big drastic ones. I was a little bit surprised by Kumaro, and I was a little bit surprised yeah. by uh, Alex Light, the left tackle, but I wasn't blown away. It's not like I didn't think those guys could be cut. Were there any surprises in your mind? Well, I thought that De Dexter Williams, they wanted to develop him further. Uh, but I guess they can't keep a lot of running backs because they may list Josiah, the tight end. They may list him as a fullback. You never know. Um, the Alex Light, anytime you have a lineman with some kind of experience, you want to keep him around. Maybe they will on a practice squad. You don't know if he's eligible for that yet. Um, but – at this particular time, I think they wanted to move on from maybe Kumaro because he's had an opportunity to break into the lineup. He hasn't had a chance to do that. So they found they want more athletes uh, in their wide, wide, receiver, wide receiver position. But you thought he would fit because his height, size, blocking ability, everything you needed. And I thought Aaron Rodgers was very fond of him. So I guess that was a surprise to the local people in Wisconsin. But nationally, you're probably right. I think every all the people who did their picks pretty much got it right. I think what people and, and yourself included couldn't see was uh, Malik Taylor and yeah. what kind of camp that kid had. Uh, this is a guy with pretty decent speed. He he's he's a very poor man, Sterling Sharp. You know, he he's not the dynamic guy that Sterling Sharp was, but he's he's. 6'1", 220, he mm -hmm. catches everything that's thrown to him, and he can be a devastating blocker in their run game, which they really count on. And the kid is, he came so far uh, in camp, he was just, he was Tim Boyle's favorite receiver. And Boyle mm -hmm. just kept, anytime he needed to, a completion, he threw it to him. And, you know, that's how you move up the, up the ranks, and that's what he did. He outperformed Kumaro. I think a lot of fans don't want that guy to be the, the Bingleton kid from uh, from Canada. They thought he was going to be this breakout player. But anytime you bring a one uh, 
a young man from another organization to yours, you know, a different scenery, Tom, really helps you, especially when you're catching, you know, passes from, you know, Aaron Rodgers or even Tim Boyle or even Jordan Love. It just gives you a, something to really come into a group that if he can flourish like Alan Lazar did last year, you never know he may get a lot of playing time. Yeah, the other thing is he didn't face Jair Alexander or Kevin King in the CFL, and that becomes a whole different ball of wax when you've got to beat guys like that off the line of scrimmage. So you have to yep. be really good in your technique, and you have to read the coverages. And I think Reggie Begleton still has a chance. He's he's on the practice squad. He's on the practice squad, right, right. So, you know, right. he just needs to get used to – anybody caught a hundred and – 10 passes or whatever it was, is still got to have some talent. And I think they'll keep keep looking at him. Yeah. Uh, that's, what the, that's, what the, that's what the practice roster is for, to keep developing. Right. And so that, that leads me into your question about the rules. Yeah. So usually you have 10 practice squad guys. This year they expanded it to 16. Okay. And, and they opened it to players of any – experience. Usually if you had, I think it was three years of accrued yeah. um, seasons, you, you could not be on the practice squad. And there were other instances too. Now, anybody, if they cut Kenny Clark tomorrow, they could put him on the practice squad. So well, I thought Alex Light can still go over there and still keep developing maybe. Right. Right. Yeah. And they could have put Kumaro on there if they wanted to. Right. Uh, so then each week on Tuesday, you can protect four of those practice squads. Guys. Okay. In other words, no other team can pick them up at that point and put them on their roster, but just four of the 16. Right. Then when you get to game day, you can, uh, you can activate two of those practice squad guys. One has to be, uh, you have to have at least eight offensive linemen. And those two guys become active, and you can put them on the game day roster if you want. Oh, nice. It, the following day, those two practice squad guys go back to the practice squad. So it's sort of like giving you some protection in case some guys test positive for COVID and all of a sudden, you know, you're caught right. short. That's that's the idea there, but it does if you if you have injuries and things, it gives you some yeah. advantages, you know. Yeah, I wonder um, how also, you get as far as the, if you're on the roster or if, do you stay with because it's a big jump in pay if for a practice squad if yeah. you're on the active roster. If you get called up to the active roster that week, you get paid the minimum NFL salary, not the okay. practice squad salary, and there is a big difference. Yeah. Uh, also, with injured reserve, uh, you can put as many guys on injured reserve as you want, and all of them are eligible to return after three weeks. Really? So, yeah. So that's a huge thing. That's why we saw them put Kamal Martin, the inside linebacker, on injured reserve. They put uh, KB and Ento, the corner, on injured reserve. They'll be back in three weeks. They both underwent surgery. That's good timing, you know. Yeah, because I was thinking about Kamal Martin when it because he was having such a pretty good camp, and it is kind of hard to see these guys because you can't see them. We had to rely on you know reporters like you to give us some kind of context based on what the team is releasing because you like to see a guy in practice or in a preseason game. You really couldn't do that, so you know by him it's going to be at least six weeks if he's on if he's if they're not stopping the run. And he has an opportunity, you know, after six or seven weeks, that would be good to know they can bring him up. Yeah. It, to compare Kamal Martin, I thought he's a little bit like Niall Diggs. Kind of remind okay. me a little bit of that type of a player. Maybe a little more physical than Niall Diggs. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, tall, uh, good wingspan, could drop into coverage, that type of a player. Oh, good. I will tell you that, though, they're in trouble at that position without him. Uh, I don't know if, what the situation is with Oren Burks. He didn't practice much on uh, Monday, mm. and I, they have not said what his injury is. 
either he's injured or they're just so down on him that he's just going to play special teams because he wasn't working with the ones. So I don't know. I, that That's going to be, given the Vikings – um, desire to run the ball, that's going to be an interesting matchup there. No question the Vikings are going to take the San Francisco tape and feel like they could exploit it. That's why, you know, Kurtz is they're going to be leaning heavily upon him to not only make the calls, get everybody lined up, but get in those gaps and stop the run, especially if they want to play this, this system where Sullivan is down in the box with Kurtz. I mean, whenever these wide receivers get any three wide receiver sets, they think you're going to be in your dime and nickel, so they're just going to run the football. But, you know, one thing back in the 90s we did to change it up a lot, Tom, we stayed in our base defense, and I would just come down on the third receiver, and then we can keep the integrity of our defense to stop the run. But when you're, a, you know, a 3-4 defense, you could do that when you have so many linebackers, but you got to make sure you have a great nose guard that can control the line of scrimmage. And you also have to have disciplined guys – for play action because if some guy bites on a play action in three four it's a huge gap in that slot area and that can that can be pretty difficult to cover so i think again minnesota is what they're going to do what they've always done with dalvin cook they're going to try to get him going early on that surface try to take take pressure off of kirk cousins but see that's the thing about it you know stefan Diggs is gone you know, they still got one of the top wide receivers. They got, a, you know, Jefferson, a rookie. You know, you know, got again, Alan Thielen. Lock him up with one of your corners, and you stack that line and force Kirk Cousins to beat you because just a nightmare knowing that, um, you know, the, you know, a quarterback, you know, didn't throw the ball but eight times in the championship game. That's That's something to be concerned about. Yeah. And I know the Packers said it was lineup issues, guys getting in gaps or whatever. But, you know, you got to make sure these quarterbacks put some pressure on them to make the right checks. And stopping the run would be paramount. I, I agree with you 100%. Even if they come out with four wides, you got to figure out a way to play your base defense and stop the run. Because then you, you want to get Kirk Cousins to third down. Then you can, yeah. you know, unleash Zedarius Smith and Preston Smith and Rashawn Gary and Kenny Clark after him. And you don't necessarily have to blitz. You know, you can, you can really pressure him. If they're running the ball well, then his play action is really good. Kirk Cousins is a good play action quarterback. So you, you're 100% right. That'll be interesting to see how they play that. Come uh, Sunday. Yeah, I just think because it's a copycat league, Tom. You know, other teams are going to see that. You know, even like a team like Detroit is going to try to run the ball. I mean, they yeah. drafted that kid from Georgia. They just want to run the football. But if the Packers can force these quarterbacks into, like you said, third down or second and long, now you can go after the quarterback. And now, you know, a guy I, I hope that can contribute on defense would be Rashard Gary. I picked him on, on, pretty much on defense to be the guy to watch out for on offense. It was Robert Tunyon. You got to get something out of these guys, especially when you're playing this kind of COVID atmosphere. You never know who's going to be available. You have to operate like that each week. You know, so Minnesota is running. They've hired Gary Kubiak to run their offense. And Gary Kubiak is a disciple of uh, Mike Shanahan and the uh, – you know, Alex Gibbs style of running yep. where they run that wide zone and they try to cut you yep. and put you on the ground. What yep. would your, be your advice? You know, you, you were on the rough side of that in a Super Bowl where they were yep. just dropping guys. How, what would be your advice to Packer uh, guys up front on how to handle that? You got to penetrate. You got to penetrate vertically. You can't go side, you know, east to west. You can't do it because the running back one cut and he is gone. You have to penetrate because every time you penetrate, they'll put their hands on your hip instead of on your knee or your thigh. Once they get on the thigh or the knee area, you're going to feel that pressure. It's going to make sure, you know, pretty much you can't cut back. But if you're penetrating, and then you'll be able to get some pressure off of play action because play action is all predicated on that run action. And a lot of things they did was a lot of eye back. You know, Minnesota would have a full back in there, and maybe they'll use Kyle Rudolph. It just as a something looked like a fullback and run a lot of play action, play action, dumping the ball over the middle. 
But that offense is something that's very efficient if they get five to six yards on first down time. That's when the playbook opens up. But if you can stop them with second and nine or second and 12 or second and 11, then you really got that offense where you want them. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. So uh, let's flip to the Packers offense. And uh, let's start with the offensive line. We know that uh, Billy Turner is a question mark at right tackle. Yeah. And they have several options there. I think the most likely would be, uh, well, the most likely would be Rick Wagner if he were healthy. And from what I kept seeing in practice, he's got a left elbow injury. He's wearing a brace on it. I don't know if he has enough strength in that arm right now. He's practicing, but I don't know if they trust that arm. So that means what do you do? Uh, I think the two options are you move, either Lane Taylor out there or you move Elton Jenkins out there? What would you do? Well, seeing that Patrick is a guy, uh, Lucas Patrick, they really like him. They could put him at guard. He could play guard or center. And they couldn't put Lane Taylor, who's had a pretty good camp. They could put him at right tackle. Now, right tackle isn't as dynamic as a left tackle, but you have to understand that you're going to be covering Khalil Mack, Robert Quinn, but the Bears twice. And you're going to do uh, Minnesota the first game, Dan Hunter and the other young man from Jacksonville uh, that they traded for twice. This, that's some of the best rushes you're going to see all year. So with that being said, you're going to see a lot of screens and draws. That's why they have so many tight ends. They're going to do a lot of max protection. These guys will chip before they go out. Because if you cannot protect Aaron Rodgers, then you really can't get into your offense. But one thing about it, you know, Aaron Jones, they're going to run the football away from certain guys and they're going to cut back. So you got to keep these linemen thinking to help the offensive linemen out. Otherwise, it does get to, you know, you know, who's on first this week. You really are rather players, and speaking from a player's point of view, players would like to know like what's my role. It's just like a pitcher. I want to know what's my fifth day. You know, when am I going to pitch ahead of time so I can get my mind right? I mean, it'd be tough to come on Wednesday and say, you're the starting right tackle when you were the left guard. Mm -hmm. It's different terminology. It's different, you know, pass sets. You know, maybe you'll kick step with your left foot, but now you got kick step with your right foot. It's a lot goes into that. So, but to, to know the scene, this, to know the scheme, I think they'll be okay there with, with the second year with Matt LaFleur's system. But it's something you definitely have to do with backs. So you may see Jamal Williams play a lot. He's one of your best, you know, running backs as far as um, protection. You may see split backs for both of these guys. They got to get some kind of protection because they got two new cornerbacks, Tom. Mm -hmm. And Devontae Adams is salivating. That's why I took him in my fantasy league. He's mm -hmm. going to put up huge numbers, okay? Yeah. Because yep. Xavier Rhodes is not there anymore. Trey Wayne's is not there anymore. So they have new guys back there. Mackenzie so Alexander that. is not there anymore. Right. They got to take they're, it You know, they're down to Mike Hughes, who is really a slot corner. He's listed as one of their starters. I don't know if he'll start or not. But right. – uh, and then they've got uh, uh, Holton Hill and Jeff Gladney. I mean, those are not household names. So right. you're right. There's some opportunity there. Absolutely. So, uh, but on the other hand, you know, this, everything we've seen is Matt LaFleur wants to run the ball. And, uh, you know, Aaron Jones has had some success in that building. How yeah. much do you give it to him? Yeah, I, I really like to think of you, Tyler Irvin, as well in the slot, because they don't really necessarily have a slot receiver. So they can use some jet sweeps with him, him and Aaron Jones together. I see Aaron Jones getting another, you know, 15 and 19 touchdown year. You really got to establish that run, you know. Uh, but the one thing about Aaron Rodgers, I would say last year was some of his best ball handling I've seen in a long time. So he's going to do a lot of play action, a lot of carry, a lot of his fakes out to make the, the backside defense in have to think. You're going to see a lot of screens and draws. But then you may see A.J. Dillon come in there in the fourth quarter time when no one really wants to tackle anymore anyway. when they If they get the lead in the fourth quarter – you can see them starting to chip away at those minutes over and over again. And next thing you know, it'll work out to something that the Packers want, and that would be a victory. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you think, lastly, before we uh, get to your prediction, what do you think the level of play is going to be like with three weeks of training camp and no mm -hmm. off-season practices? What do you think we're going to see? I think the one thing you could go off of is what the NBA, it was a little sloppy at times, but some teams did very well. I mean, you know, guys were, this is something unprecedented planned in a pandemic. So it's going to be some adjustments there. Uh, that's why they had the opt out period. You know, that's what Funches opt out. I think the first couple weeks, it's going to be maybe a little hesitant and tackling, get used to the rules. But after like week three, I think it'll go back to normal. Because, guys, once you're in that stadium, you'll realize there's no fans. And you'll realize the only fan that you have is your teammate in the sideline. That's why the NBA, when these guys dunk or shoot a shot, you get more to cheerleading from your sideline. You'll see a more animated sideline. You know, guys will be very excited. Of course, they won't be able to do the leap. But the one thing you get is from your teammates giving you a high five. That means all the world to it. But I will say this, though, Tom, you must get out to a fast start in this kind of climate because you never know what can happen each week. So if you can get out to a good start, you know, four and two, five and one, or even six and oh, well, obviously can't do none of that if you don't win the first game. But the team that gets out to the best start puts pressure on everybody, especially with the playoffs being expanded. Do you, do you expect the Packers to um, make a gesture uh, pregame in relation to the social justice movement? I do. I, I really do, because I think they understand that, you know, the thing that happened with Jacob Blake happened right in their backyard. And I think they want people to understand that they're playing a game, but they also need to, you know, call attention as much as possible to the racial injustice of every day, because they also understand that you may lose a fan or two behind it, but some things are bigger than football. And I think if you're going to play in a pandemic, you should be able to do whatever you want to do, especially if, if it's positive. This is something peaceful. No one, you know, is no player is for looting, violence. They condemn all that stuff. But they also want to be have free, you know, to express how they feel what's going on in their cities back home. And we're not broke up into Democratic cities or Republican cities. We're the United States of America. So each team is going to do something different. But I think the Green Bay Packers, seeing that the Jacob Blake, you know, situation just happened in their backyard and the George Floyd thing happened in Minnesota, these two teams are going to have heavy hearts because those are the two the most polarized, I mean, polarizing things that just happened this offseason for 2020. It's been just a terrible year. So with Minnesota and the Vikings playing, I think it's only fitting that these two teams play to kick us off you know, for a wonderful season. I know they got a game on Thursday, but, you know, the Packers and this rivalry, if you want to go to the Super Bowl, if you're in Minnesota, you must beat the Packers. And if you want to win the Super Bowl or go to a Super Bowl, you must beat the Minnesota Vikings. It'd be interesting if they did something together with the Vikings, given they're exactly. from two different states. I don't know that that would happen, but it would be interesting. Okay, let's get to your prediction. What do you, what are you thinking? What let Minnesota lost too many guys, Everson Griffin. I mean, I know they still got Harrison Smith on the top um, safeties, but they lost too many guys on that on that defense. To to I feel like they can beat the Packers. The Packers are a thirteen and three team, whether you believe it or not. The Packers are a team that ran the ball well, that threw the ball well, didn't turn the ball over. I think the Packers will win twenty eight seventeen, and I think more than anything, I think you'll start to see guys start to come into their own. You know, the Jair Alexanders, and you also should see the Kevin Kings, these guys stepping up, playing man-to-man -man with no help. You guys go stop the run. I look for Zadarius Smith to do like he's always done ever since he's been in that uniform, being a leader. I look for Mercedes Lewis to get his guys on point, and I also look for Aaron Rodgers to do like he's always done since he's been in, uh, in a Green Bay Packer uniform that's will his team to victory. So I see the Packers winning 28-17. And who do you see winning the division? Say again, I'm sorry. Who do you see winning the division? 
Well, the Packers, I think, can win the division. I think uh, Chicago upgraded with Robert Quinn, so they got back to defense, but they still got Mr. Trubisky there, him and Nick Fulte kind of working that thing out of quarterback. The Packers are the only team that seem to be more stable. They didn't, you know, they, they got most of the core players back, although Brian Villaga is going to hurt, but they're going to have to manage that situation. When anytime Aaron Rodgers is playing, he's going to be the favorite in that division. He's the best quarterback in the in the North. And I think for the most part, Matt LaFleur is one of the best coaches in the North. So I think, and he was last year. So I pick, hey, listen, I don't, the only way the Packers for some – some foreseen something that we haven't seen or talk about each week on five questions that happens, you know, an injury, a guy going into protocol or something like that. If it stay true to form, they'll win between 10 and 12 games and they'll win the division. Once you get into the playoffs, anything can happen. But again, as long as you have Aaron Rodgers, you're one of the six or seven teams that legitimately have a chance at going to a Super Bowl. Okay. There you have it. Great. Well, it was fun to do uh, week one, and yes. we will be back again. Uh, we will be trying to get an X's and O's if we can figure it out. <laughs> Bill's <laughs> working on it, and uh, <laughs> yeah. hopefully we'll have it you know, next week or the week after that. Yeah, and I want to thank uh, Vinny's Sausage Company for helping me develop my new brat that's coming soon. I got you and Bill some, too, uh, in the next couple of weeks, so I'll let you know where you can pick those up. Also, want to thank Ivanhoe's Pub and Eatery in Racine. Well, you can say Mount Pleasant, Racine area. Thank you so much for sponsoring this. And again, Tom and Bill, I appreciate you guys every week. This is a lot of fun. I think the fans are going to really enjoy it. Yep, for sure. Until next week, we'll see ya. Bye-bye.